know why they got to come up during October until Christmas time to get set up to do these things. So it depends on what they want to do. <laughs> I'm going to have this thing each night of program. Okay. Songs and things. I would just like to do this. Thursday night you can go by every year. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday School Hour. Glad to see everybody this morning. Let's get our hymn books. Turn to hymn number 71. Let's stand as we sing. Sweet Hour of Prayer. Hymn number 71. Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet Hour of
been praying this week. We had prayer last night here at the church, a great turnout, amen? And I hope and trust that you've been praying for the revival coming up this week. Brother Bill Dodson, would you open us in prayer this morning? Amen, and thank you, and you can be seated this morning. What a wonderful blessing it is to be at the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements we have this morning. Of course, everybody knows that 14th through the 19th is revival starting today, and then at 7 o'clock during the weeknight. And I pray that you're, um, you've been praying for our revival, that souls would be revived and if there's any lost souls, that they would be saved. Amen. And so let's, uh, let's be praying about that. And then men's meeting Monday, uh, April 22nd at 6 p.m. Brother Bill Kinsler will be bringing our devotion. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. I like to see men in the church get involved. Amen. Hey, if you've been saved, you got something to say. Youth meeting, Friday, April 26th at 6 p.m. Listen, if youth, young people, parents in here this morning, get your young people here. Uh, get involved in that. You know, I was talking to Carla last night, and I was telling her, you know, I feel so ashamed because I don't know all of, I, I get the names mixed up of the young people and I ought to be, I don't even call them by name. I just say, good morning, ladies, you know, and I, I should be a little bit more personable than that, other than like some mean old boogeyman and try to be nice to these people, encourage these young people. They need encouragement, friend. They're out there living in it every day while most of us are retired or we go to our job and we got a few people that, you know, that might have a little effect on us. But these people, uh, these young people, they're affected. The peer pressure's straight out of hell today. So let's be praying for them. And then church-wide visitation. Oh, get them here. Get them here. And if they have friends, get them here. Amen. Church-wide visitation, Saturday April 27th at 10 a.m. So let's be here. That's the most, one of the most, that's the very most important ministry that Grace Baptist Church has right there is winning lost souls to Christ. So let's be here for that. And then I got this, and I don't know how exactly maybe to, uh, to make this uh, announcement, but it's the ladies' meeting. May the 9th, it's going to be at the Iron Fork Restaurant. The cost is $15 per person, drink included. You have meal choices here. And so what they want you to do, we're going to have this on the back. They want you to sign your name, and then with these meal choices, you put your choice of meal that you want that day, okay, where they'll know how to place the order and you won't sit there for three hours waiting on your fried chicken salad. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, today is some birthdays. Blake Ferguson, he's not here this morning, but if you see him, tell him happy birthday. And then Miss Jessie Lynn Eckenrode. And so let's sing happy birthday to Miss Jessie. Miss Jessie, will you wave your hand back there if you're not going to stand? <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you, Miss Jessie. Listen, she was one of the first teenagers in my teenage class when I was teaching here. And she stood the test of time. And I appreciate you, Miss Jessie. Amen for hanging in there. All right, Brother Jessie. Happy birthday.
ushers, you can come for the Sunday school offering this morning. Amen. <laughs> Pray for me this morning, amen. I, I have probably, I, I think I've told this here before, but uh, it's pretty fitting, and it probably has pertained to me at some point in time. But the name of it is Mistaken Identity. A man was being tailgated by a stressed out woman on a busy boulevard when suddenly the light turned yellow just in front of him. He did the right thing and stopped, even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. The tailgating woman hit the roof and the horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection. As she was still in mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer. Amen. The officer ordered her to exit her car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. After several hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you and cussing a blue streak at him. I noticed the Choose Life license plate, the What Would Jesus Do bumper sticker, the Follow Me to Sunday School bumper sticker, and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. Naturally, I assume you had stolen the car. <laughs> well, I don't know that I go that far, but I have probably been close. On a more serious note, condemning death to America chants, somebody chanting death to America, it should be easy for a red-blooded American patriot to condemn something like that, I would think. Mission Governor Gretchen Whitmer is staying silent about the death to America chants at a Dearborn, Michigan, pro-Palestine protest that went on for the last few days there. Now, I'm afraid, and I'm not the governor, I'd never get a chance to be, but if I was the governor and that was going on, the I doubt I'd call the National Guard because it's part of the federal government, but if I could come up with a good militia, I'd call them in. A man stabbed six people to death at a busy Sydney shopping center Saturday. Eight other people, including a nine-month-old, were injured in attack also. Now, let me tell you something. This just happened this week. I thought it pretty uh, interesting is that the liberals are now, they're backing up on, and I'm not, I'm not, here to about a political issue here so don't don't get too nervous I'm not pushing guns and that you ought to own 150 like I do but 
I've noticed that the liberals now, they're backing up on their statement that guns are the problem. See, they, they've been blaming guns. Now they're realizing, hey, this guy stabbed six people to death in a mall. You going to outlaw your, your butter knives now? But see, they're realizing now that it's a sin problem. It's a sin problem. It's a people problem. And it's about time. Now maybe we can get the Baptist preachers to wake up. Proverbs 14, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Without revival, there will be no survival in America. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. They're here. They're not coming, they're here. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Okay, even if you took that out of the homosexual uh, arena, that, that verse right there, I mean that statement right there, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Check out the statistics now. There's more workout clubs in America than there's ever been. Yeah. They sell more mirrors to a workout club than they do anywhere else because people like to look at yourself, and especially men as they preen Brother Butch and flex their muscle and look in there like, God help us. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Boy, that's going on, isn't it? Disobedient to parents, unthankful. People are unthankful. And it ain't just talking about young people here. I'm talking about they're just unthankful people everywhere. Sit down to eat a meal. Don't even bow your head and pray just like pigs at a trough. At least the pig looks up when you're pouring it in. <laughs> Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures. Boy, we see that, don't we? Everybody's got, you know, Brother Wiley, you know, my dad used to say as long as it's beer 30 in America, as long as people are being entertained, as long as they're pleasure seekers, and they're out there seeking it. That's where we're at here in America today. But denying, uh, let's see, more than the lovers of God, having a form of godliness. Boy, we, we, we had that, and it's kind of fading away now, but we've had the form of godliness in America for a long time. I mean, you can't go three miles without running into a steeple. That's a form of godliness. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen. 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 What's going on in the world today is a result of what's not going on in our churches Today, if I get time to get to it, and I'm going to do my best to try to get to my lesson today, I'm going to work hard at it. And if I get to my lesson today, the text, I mean the, the scripture that I was, and the word I was going to teach about is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found Faithful. Faithful. And stewardship right here is simply just recognizing that everything that the Lord has given us since we've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, everything that he's given us is a gift from God and we should be grateful and generous with those gifts. We need to be found faithful. Now, I hadn't got to my lesson yet, and I'm sorry that last Sunday, 
that I have been giving y'all all these facts about Georgia and all of these facts about Texas and what this young lady, this teenager from, uh, from Georgia that was 17 years old in 1835 had to do with Brother Lester Roloff in 1964. I told you there was a correlation between them. There is a something that uh, ties them together. And I'm fixing to tell you because I was supposed to tell you last Sunday. And I got so caught up in whatever I got caught up in that I forgot to. But this young lady from Georgia uh, designed this flag and sent with a uh, Georgia militia out to Texas to fight in the 1800s. And on the um, flag, there was a one side of the flag had liberty or death. And on the other side, it had where liberty dwells, there is our country. Well, in 1964, I told you that Miss uh, Joanna Troutman is her name that designed that flag that was sent to Texas that became a Texas flag. Um, you say, well, what's that got to do with Brother Roloff? Well, I'm going to tell you. 1964, Brother Roloff was told about a piece of property over in Culloden, Georgia. It was 273 acres, and Brother Roloff had no money, and I read that story to you last week. He didn't have a dime, no money to buy it with, but felt like God wanted him to have it. So he stepped out by faith and purchased that property within 30 days and burnt the note at the first camp meeting that they had on that property, Brother Brooks. The name of his airplane, Brother Roloff flew an airplane, and there's a picture of it right here, and there's a, his airplane right there, and on the front of that airplane, there was some words that had liberty or death. And right beside the door that you walked up to go into the plane was a sign that said the Liberty Bell. That's what he named his airplane, the Liberty Bell. Well, what ties them two together is more than just that flag right there. And Brother Roloff had no idea about this when he bought this. This is God's divine providence. I know some of y'all believe in coincidences and stuff like that out there in the YouTube world. But this was God's divine providence. He bought the plantation that Miss Troutman was born on. Did not have any idea about that. What you think about that, Brother Bush? I think it's something to get a little excited about. I've had two pastors before I came to Grace Baptist Church. One was my dad, Wiley Cameron Sr., and then my other pastor was Brother Lester Roloff. Those, those were the only two pastors that I ever had before I came here. And Brother Roloff used to say, I see no hope for revival among God's people today. They are so enamored and so cluttered up with Hollywood, newspapers, magazines, and parties, and bowling alleys, and camping trips, and everything else. How in the world are they going to get still long enough to hear or see anything from God? Amen. That's a quote of his. You can look it up on the Internet. So usually if you've sat in my class very long and you've been in here for quite a few years, I used to do a little study right before we would have a revival about revival. I didn't do that this year, but I did run across a couple of things that I think will help us. And uh, we can use it this morning, but there's a great Georgia revival of 1827. Brother Butch, you and I have talked about this. But uh, the great Georgia revival of 1827 began in prayer and impacted a region in the revival of God's people that led to a spiritual awakening in communities across the state of Georgia. 
Mr. Pastor Sherwood was a pastor in Eatonton, Georgia, where over a hundred souls were converted. Other pastors, churches, and denominations become involved in preaching and sharing Christ. During the season of revival, over 16,000 were added to Baptist churches. Sam Jones was one of the preachers in that meeting. And he would go down in the crowd that were there at the meeting and he would grab men by the collars and preach to them and shake them and says, quit your meanness. Now before I go any further with that, I've seen that kind of revival before. Amen. I've been involved in that kind of revivals before. I seen Sammy Allen walk down to my wife. Independent Baptist churches and they're going to go out the door mad yeah. and they ain't coming back yeah. because they hadn't been hearing the whole counsel of God they've had enough love and God loves you they don't know what to do with whole counsel preaching anymore but old Sam Jones he preached to these guys grabbed them by the collar and shook them and said quit your meanness and guess what happened? In Sandtown, Georgia, every person of an accountable age was saved. And they renamed the town to Newburn, Georgia. Right up the road from us. That's where they got their name, Newborn, Georgia. Wouldn't you like to have a revival where so many people get saved it changed the name of the town? I hope we have that kind of revival today. This week also, there's a, another revival story, and this is one of my dad's favorites. Um... This is his Bible. He's got a saying of Lorenzo Dow's in the front of his Bible. But I'll tell you this story right fast. You'll have a little uh, history about revivals in Georgia. <clears throat> now, the, uh, these days, you can't turn on the TV without seeing one religious channel after another. But back in the old days, when there wasn't any TV, or cars for that matter, the traveling preacher was the only man of God some country folk got to see. Lorenzo Dow was one of the best-known traveling preachers back in the 1800s. He was tall and skinny with wild eyes, long stringy hair, a thick beard, and a slight hunchback. He had a booming voice that made sinners across the country shake in their boots. Repent now, my brothers and sisters, repent, he would scream in every town he visited. And many people did just that. Lorenzo loved the outdoors and would rather sleep on cold, hard ground in the woods than the most comfortable feather bed in town. I could get started right there, but I'm going to leave that alone. He had been on the road preaching since he was a teenager and figured there was no town wicked enough or tough enough to withstand his crusade for God. But then, Lorenzo Dow had never visited Jacksonboro, Georgia. Now, back in those times, Jacksonboro was a tough frontier town about 100 miles upriver from Savannah. Tough, rugged, 
lumbermen cut down the town out of the Georgia pine wilderness, and each day they'd chop down trees and ship them down river to Savannah. It was backbreaking work, and after a long day, the men liked nothing better than a good stiff drink. We'll make that many stiff drinks. Folks used to say there were so many drunken brawls in Jacksonboro, saloons each night, the next morning you'd, in saloons, that you'd see children picking up eyeballs in tea saucers. So needless to say, the men of Jacksonboro were not going to be the most receptive crowd for a traveling preacher. But that didn't stop Lorenzo. He walked into town one day. I could get started right there, but I'm not. He walked into town one day with nothing and immediately began preaching about the evils of alcohol. That whiskey is the devil's water, he screamed at the top of his lung. You're all going straight to hell if you don't watch it, no doubt about it. Imagine that today. Well, he's so offensive. Now, Jacksonboro was already a pretty rough town, but Lorenzo had the additional misfortune of arriving on the day the townsfolk were celebrating the naming of Jacksonboro as the county seat. So many of the men were roaring drunk and in no mood to be lectured. So they pelted Lorenzo with rotten vegetables and screamed, Go home, preacher man. Nobody cares what you got to say. I could get started right there, but I'm not. The crowd then laughed and turned away and went back to the saloons. But they didn't call Lorenzo Crazy Dow for nothing. Rather than heed their warning, Lorenzo marched into the nearest saloon and began preaching all over again. And he yelled, and the Lord's going to put an end to your sinful ways right now. And with that, Lorenzo grabbed an iron tool and broke open a barrel of whiskey, sending its contents spilling on the floor. When you, get, when you get a few years, you go ahead and find me a preacher that still do that today. When you get time, now I knew some in my day. I'm talking about today, where we're living at today. Find me some that's willing to go this route, and I'll get in line behind them, friend. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. I'll get in line beside them. He smashed the whiskey glasses on the bar. Listen to me. Leave this den of sin right now and get right with the Lord, he yelled. With that, that was the final straw. The townsfolk grabbed Lorenzo and threw him through the doors of the saloon. They pushed him to the ground and gathered around him a drunken, crazed mob. What should we do with him, one of the men asked. Hey, somebody get a rope. Let's hang him, screamed another. Cheers erupted from the crowd as the men grabbed Lorenzo and looked for, around for the nearest tree. Suddenly, a voice shouted from behind the crowd, stop it. The men turned to find Seaborn Goodall approaching them. Mr. Goodall was a teetotaler and a deeply religious man, but he was also a hard worker just like the other men and had therefore earned their respect. This preacher may have made you mad, but that doesn't mean you should break the law. Let him stay with me and my family tonight. I promise he'll be gone in the morning and won't ever bother you again. The drunken men looked at each other, then reluctantly shoved Lorenzo toward Mr. Goodall. You're a lucky man, preacher, one of them said. You best do as he says and be out of here come morning or there will be a hanging. So Lorenzo stayed that night with the Goodall family, relieved yet angry. I know there's some of us in here that real pious and real good Christians and we don't ever get angry the Bible says be angry and sin not so, so brother uh, Lorenzo hadn't sinned here 
And the Bible also says lay hands suddenly on no man. Now, it don't say, it don't say don't lay hands on a man. It just says don't do it real fast. In all of his years of preaching, never had he visited a town that was so beyond hope, so trapped in its wicked ways. In his mind, the town's folk of Jacksonboro was simply beyond redemption except for the kind Mr. Goodall. The next morning, Lorenzo emerged from the Goodall home and prepared his horse for departure. The angry crowd from the previous night had returned to the Goodall home watching Lorenzo with foggy, bloodshot eyes, making sure he was really leaving for good. Lorenzo climbed onto a borrowed horse and rode slowly to the edge of town, the snickering crowd following closely behind him. When he reached the town limits, he suddenly stopped, removed one of his shoes, and with dramatic flair shook the dust from the bottom. I came here to help save you from your sin, he cried out, but you would not receive me. So I have no choice but to shake the dust of this wicked town off my feet. Your town is hereby cursed. It will wither and die from its wickedness, so saith the Lord. He then pointed at the good old house and said, But the good old house will remain, for they received me and heard my voice. Waves of laughter erupted from the townspeople as Lorenzo galloped away. Then they turned and walked back into town, and as the months went by, the story of the crazy preacher always guaranteed a hearty round of laughs in the taverns. But for the most part, his warning was forgotten until a series of strange and destructive fires began plaguing the town. When the first home burned to the ground, everybody thought it was a freak accident or a lightning streak, or maybe some drunken fool had fell asleep smoking a cigarette. Then another home burned down, followed by another, then several more, all without explanation. The fires were followed by vicious storms that destroyed even more buildings. And what nature didn't destroy, the local economy did. The lumber industry Slowed down, the men in town lost their jobs, the town people suddenly remembered the parting words of the crazy preacher. And whether it was from fear or the lack of jobs, the remaining families began moving out one by one until the town of Jacksonboro died away. Today, you won't find Jacksonboro on any Georgia map. The county seat moved to Sylvania, Georgia, and there's not one marker indicating where Jacksonboro used to be, except for one building on a dirt road where the house once stood. You'll find a lone white clapboard house. There's nothing remarkable about it until you find out that its previous owner was none other than Seaborn Goodall, the man whose kindness saved him from the curse of Lorenzo Dow. So, and that is a factual story. You can go check it out. I am glad to say that Brother Morgan is here to start our revival. I'm very uh, thankful for the effect that his preaching and his youth camp meeting has had on our church. Um, our young people went up there last year and come back with a different outlook. A young couple went along with them. They come back with a different outlook. And it's only the preaching of the word of God that's going to change people. I started, uh, I started the other day reading this article that my dad had wrote about and telling you about Noah's Ark. And our pastor brought it up about this Noah's Ark that my dad had this picture that he drew. And it had these smiley faces on the outside of the ark. It's a smile. God loves you. 
And um, his, his basic thing about this, uh, about this article that he wrote, it says, I'm afraid we've omitted the key to genuine the key to genuine repentance, which is the law of God. Paul reminded us in Romans 7, 7, I would have not known sin except through the law. The law of God is rarely used in modern day evangelism because rather than God-centered preaching, we have made it man-centered and rather than driving the sinner to the gospel net using the law, we try to attract them by, by holding up only the benefits of salvation. Our invitations are trying to attract sinners with all kind of goodies. I want you to pay close attention to this article now, okay? The invitation begins with head bowed and eye closed. Will you slip down the aisle so that you can have love, joy, peace, and make your life happy? Jesus will give you what you've been looking for. Thus, instead of desperate sinners knocking on the door of heaven, we have tried to entice them with fringe benefits and tried to argue sinners into the kingdom by appealing to their intellect and on occasion even attempted to scare them into heaven by 666 campaign. Our efforts have been to try to seduce them into the kingdom by telling them that Jesus will make them happy while the, while the missing key has been our failure to warn them of the law that they have broken. The great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, has said they will never accept grace until they tremble before a just and holy law. Wherefore then serveth the law? Number one, it shows our guilt before a holy God and stops us from justifying ourselves. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Number two, the law brings us to the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. And number three, the law points us to Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, and verse 24. We need to be done with our smiley button religion and our bumper sticker Christianity and get back to making our preacher preaching God-centered rather than man-oriented. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the picture. But before I do, today in most fundamental independent Baptist churches, and I'm not going to let up on it, I'm not going to let up on it, I'm not going to let up on it. I'm going to get harder about it and harder about it and harder about it. But today, can you hear... Noah's warning, Noah's warning today would be quite different coming from preachers today. This is my article here. Even among the fundamental ranks, it would probably sound like this. Last night when I turned off the TV, the weather channel said we could possibly have some light precipitation as well as a little wind, but isn't God good? Meanwhile, it's storming like crazy and a lost and dying world is drowning and going to hell outside the four walls of the church. What's wrong with the picture? People need to be warned of the impending judgment of God not lulled into a false sense of security. Amen. And we've about done it, friend. We've about done it. We, now, it's a shame, and I'm not going to call this man's name out, but it just happened. He's a TV evangelist. He's one of those prosperity preachers. But here he goes. This is his words. And I'm just going to call him a prosperity preacher here. I'll try not to call his name. I might slip up. A prosperity preacher has publicly repented for failing to preach the whole gospel and criticized American churches for refusing to address sin and repentance to a watching world. 
the former drug addict turned evangelist revealed he recently underwent a season of painful pruning where God impressed upon him the importance of preaching on the topic of sin and the need for a savior. If people don't know they're sinners, they won't see their need for a savior. This is hard for people. It's hard for me, he says, because I feel like I haven't preached the whole gospel. And I repent. I repent. You have no idea. I will not be responsible. I believe that when I preach that the blood of people is on my hands. God, if we could get back to that in our churches. The pastor has previously, this pastor has previously been criticized in promoting, for promoting the prosperity gospel, which teaches in part that believers have a right to the blessings of health and wealth. But in his sermon on Sunday, the evangelist said he believes God is correcting him for failing to preach the whole gospel in the past. He revealed that the writings of famed theologian Charles Spurgeon has been convicting him. Hmm. When you come into the gospel, because you come in for an easier life, you've come in for the wrong gospel, he addressed. Well, we hear that, don't we? I challenge you today. You got a YouTube. Most of you got a YouTube. Most of you got one in your pocket or your purse right now. Get on it. Find me a preacher within 65 mile radius of Eatonton, Georgia, that's preaching against sin this morning. Find me one. When you come to Jesus because he's going to give you this and give you that, then you really didn't come to Jesus. The Bible says we are dead in our sins. We have to get out. We have to someone. We have to somehow get to people and not just promise them an easier, better life. I know this isn't. Legalism, it's the truth. There is a day of wrath coming. How can you want to be found if you don't even know you're lost? How can you want to see if you don't? How can you want to see if you don't know that you're blind? How can you want to live if you don't know that you're dead? I pray today that we open our hearts to the preaching that we're going to get this week. Today, I hope that we try to be faithful in attendance. That's what our verse was. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. I hope we're faithful in our attendance as much as we can be this week. I pray that you pray for Carla and I. This next week, we won't be here. We're going down to lower Alabama. And I pray that you pray for me. Carla's going to sing. I'm going to preach. And I pray that you pray for me that I preach the whole council. That I don't stand in fear or favor to man. Or whether I'm going to be asked to come back or not. I pray that you pray for us as we get ready for this summer. The Lord's opening some doors. We're going up to a camp meeting that will be going a couple of weeks up in Virginia. Pray for us as we go there. And a lot of you have asked me, and I was approached, and the reason I'm bringing this up, a lot of you have asked me, Brother Wiley, you, you sure preach about Brother Roloff a lot. Well, um, and they start telling me about uh, these rumors that they hear or read about on the Internet about Brother Roloff, the negativity that's brought up about him and stuff like that. And the only way I got to answer that is if you were sitting in the marketplace back in Joseph's day and you had heard about the story of Brother Joseph and Potiphar's wife, then you would probably leave, believe that story, that, was, that rumor that was going around in the marketplace about Joseph too. See. You'd be one of them that wouldn't say Joseph uh, left his coat but kept his dignity, you would believe that he left his coat because he couldn't get along fast enough is what you would be believing. 
So don't believe everything you hear about that. And I believe, I believed in Brother Roloff because his ministry was a success. Why do you think it was a success, Brother Wiley? Well, I'm going to tell you. Most average church members in America today, if they're faithful, they attend 166 services in one year. For 23 years for Carla and I, 24 years for Carla and I, for 30-something years for my mom and my dad, they listen to 1,362 messages a year. A year. Not 166, 1,362 messages a year from God's Word. And until we get back to this and get away from the uh, stuffing the Easter eggs and, and putting up uh, paganistic Christmas trees and talking about the fat Santa Claus, and we don't get back to this Word, friend, we're going to lose our church, our country. Our children, uh, we've almost lost our children now. So we better get back to preaching today. Amen. Amen. Let's be dismissed. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your word. God, help it to convict us to stand on it in this trying time that we live in today. I pray for every church member of Grace Baptist Church. Pray for Brother Morgan as he comes and preaches to us today. Lord, help us to have our hearts open and tenderized with your word today in Jesus name. Amen. All right, we got a few minutes before the next service. Amen, brother. Could you you've, you've heard that you've heard old Lorenzo Dow more than anybody, has not you? Hey, is that the same guy that preached on the rock over there in Nashville? Yes, sir. I do know where you're talking about. That was, yes, yes sir, that, uh, that road sign's still over there. That marker's over there on, uh, what is that, Highway 11? Yes, sir. I haven't seen that marker, but I heard you talk a lot about it. And you know, I was just going to, I kept moving the story. A lot of times, even in the Bible, I can remember the story, but I'm not, not remembering the name. Yes, I do remember about the guy. Yep. <laughs> 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 <laughs>